Um, I'm excited to introduce our next and final keynote speaker, um, who is Lisa Bender. She is a global expert on education in crisis affected contexts and is currently with UNICEF at a New York City headquarters, where she provides technical and policy advice with a focus on complex emergencies. Um, she, uh, her current focus includes expanding global efforts to better protect education from attack and examining how new technologies can advance educational equity, especially for girls. Her talk today is actually going to focus about um, the, work, um, sorry, the work of the United Nations and how it's been advancing an agenda for humanity to alleviate suffering, reduce risk, and lessen vulnerability on a global scale. As soon as we figure out how to connect my computer. <laughs> I'm really excited to hear the talk. Hello everyone, I'm so happy to be here with you. I wanted to give a special thanks to Raj and Juan Rojas for inviting me to be a part of this event. So as you'll have noticed, my profile is quite different <laughs> than yours, um, but I hope that you will learn something from my presentation because I've certainly learned a great deal from listening to your talks this afternoon and going to your poster presentations. So just a little bit about me, um, I work at UNICEF, which many of you may know is the United Nations Children's Organization. Um, and at UNICEF, we have started shifting the way that we work to assist children around the world. And we're really looking to work in new ways with new partners and thinking about how innovations and new technologies can advance the rights of children. Um, so I started this work, I think, for many of the same reasons that you all are here today. I wanted to do something good in the world. I started out in the Peace Corps. I served two years in rural Cameroon. Um, I see some of you smiling. Maybe that means you're also RPCBs. Um, hello. Um, and when I was in the Peace Corps, I think the most important thing I learned was humility. That you think you know things, you think you can do things, and you realize that you don't know anything. <laughs> so while I was there, I got malaria. Someone ate my cat. I had a lot of struggles. It was a very difficult time. Um, but I learned a lot of things, too. And I think that the important things that I learned were that kids everywhere have the same dreams. They all want to do big things with their lives, and they, we have to do everything we can to support that. And I also learned that all of our actions matter. It's hard to feel connected to people that live very far away, but the way that we consume, the way that we act, the way that we research, the way that we act with our colleagues and work together really makes a difference to people all around the world, and more so today than ever before. So I'm going to try to touch a little bit on those aspects during my presentation, and I'm also going to share some of the things we're doing at UNICEF where we need your help specifically. Like, we have asks. We need guidance on how to move this work forward. So we have many, many areas of work, but I'm only going to touch on a few that I know a little bit about. So the bad news is that things are not good right now, as many of you may be aware. We're working towards the Sustainable Development Goals, and that means by 2030, we'd like to have achieved many shared goals around eliminating poverty, diminishing inequalities, um, ensuring that everyone has access to education and health care, that human rights are better respected. But based on current trends, this summer we did a big review of where we are with SDG 4, which is the education goal, Education for All, and many other progress reports, by 2030, most of the world's children will be living in countries that are affected by humanitarian situations. Because of climate change, because of the protracted nature of crisis, because of the unprecedented levels of forced migration we're experiencing right now, more children will be living in places affected by crisis than ever before. There will also be less public resources to assist those children and make sure they're realizing their rights. And in these countries, we'll see the biggest challenges to education equality. So more bad news. Um, right now, the, the world is in a situation where conflict and crisis is growing. And it's having bigger implications because of the fact that we're more connected. So we know that this is costing our economy, this is costing our growth, this is costing us equality in the ways that we're advancing um, social rights, human rights, and protection. So one example that the World Bank gave was that should we have, um, 
just even a moderate to severe pandemic, that a fast-moving airborne disease such as the Spanish flu that broke out in, 18, in 1918, that 33 million people would die in just 250 days, and that this could erode 4.8% of the global GDP. So the things that happen far away can really affect us. One of the programs that I'm supporting now is the massive Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And sometimes when I talk about it, people are like, what? There's Ebola? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it's not over yet. It's still there. Um, it's still a concern. There have been some reported cases in bordering countries. So this is really a very pressing issue that can affect us and we should be concerned about. Fortunately, more bad news. Um, I'm sure that many of you have been listening and inspired by Greta recently. Um, she's brought a claim against the United Nations, against member states, um, saying that adults, all of us here, have violated um, the Convention of the Rights of the Child and, is, and ensuring that children have a safe and secure place to live because we're burning our house down. Um, and we know that when these bad things happen that they don't affect all of us equally. We know that the people that suffer the most are women, poor people, people in rural areas, children, and especially adults and children with disabilities, and any group that's marginalized. So that really puts an onus on us to use our privilege and our position and our resources to close that inequality. So even though we know if we plan smarter, we could save a lot in response dollars by investing in preparedness and prevention. I think the World Bank current statistics are for every dollar invested in prevention and preparedness, we save $16 later on down the road. And yet only 3% of humanitarian aid is going into that, those smarter investments. Um, this is my last kind of serious bad news slide. Um, UNICEF was started in 1946, at the end of World War II, when there were an unprecedented number of orphans. People's parents had been killed in the war, and we didn't know what to do with all of these fatherless and motherless children. So the world pulled together and said, we need to do something together. Um, unfortunately, that's still very much the case today. As I said, we're facing unprecedented forced migration, and so this is putting a lot of children in dangerous situations. Um, this picture represents a grave site that we built at the UN General Assembly this summer. Every single backpack represents a child who's not going back to school because they were killed in conflict last year. This is the highest number we've ever had since we started recording. So the dangers are increasing for children, which puts much more responsibility in us to protect them. And we have to ask ourselves, how are these children dying? They're dying by drone strikes. They're, drawing, they're dying by rocket-launched mortar attacks. They're dying by targeted attacks on schools, on hospitals, and communities where people live. So there's, a less, there's less humanitarian space. There's less respect for human rights. There's less respect for the protection of civilians. And so many of you have been talking about drone technology and the ways in which we can help people using this technology, but we also know that a lot of these technologies are not being used for good. So, I mean, I guess the bottom line is that progress is possible, and we know that. We have more people attending school now than ever before. We have lower child mortality rates than ever before. But this progress is not promised. We have to protect it. We have to continue to invest in it. And the good news is that all of you have more possibility and power to protect that progress than ever before. Individual action is more impactful than it's ever been. So given the state of the world, in 2016, the Secretary General called for a World Humanitarian Summit. And this was an opportunity for all of us to come together and say, hey guys, things are getting worse and the things that we're doing aren't working anymore. We need to do things differently and we need to do things better. So we came together and agreed on a set of principles. Um, I don't know if this is an appropriate joke, but if any of you have ever seen the movie Team America, there's a scene where there's a dictator and the UN goes to visit them and the dictator is engaged in terrible human rights abuses and they're like, we're gonna write you a very angry letter. So we don't have a lot of power at the UN to do things when people are violating rights. We count on you, we count on member states, we count on individual citizens and people to take action to end human rights abuses. Because our power is only in bringing people together. So we brought the most powerful organizations together and got them to commit to the grand bargain. And the grand bargain essentially says that we'll do things more efficiently and we'll do things together to save more money while we also try to raise more money to assist people in need. So we think we can save over five, uh, I'm sorry, an extra billion dollars over the next five years. 
And this is really about a participation revolution. And that means doing things with people instead of for them. We're pushing for greater transparency. And we're really saying, OK, not how can we help people, but how can we end need? How can we end the need to have to help people? How can we help people help themselves? And one of the most immediate actions we've committed to is um, ensuring that more humanitarian aid goes directly to communities that are affected and to local organizations. So we're hoping to shift the amount of global humanitarian aid to local organizations to 25% by next year. So we set a really high mark for ourselves and we're gonna continue to reach and um, work towards that goal. One of the other outcomes of the World Humanitarian Summit was the agenda for humanity. So we had five big goals, to prevent and end conflicts, to respect the rules of war, to leave no one behind, to work differently together to end need, and to invest in humanity. Um, we all have a role to play in one and two, but I think specifically for this group, we can do a lot to advance three through five. This opportunity affords us new technologies, new partners, new actors, um, new ways of working together to really create change. So on the left side, um, I think we can see that there's really this emphasis on working together. How do we reinforce local systems? How do we invest in local capacities and local people? The middle is really about working smarter. You know, when I talked about preparedness, um, how do we anticipate crises and risks? So I've been really excited about a lot of the um, presentations that I've seen today about how we can invest more in early warning and how we can use data to indicate when there's going to be trouble. And then the right is where we really are investing in the power of people to help themselves. How can we empower more girls and women? How can we ensure that everyone has access to education, especially in times of crisis? So last year, when we look at the entire financing envelope for humanitarian aid, only 3% went to education. And so, you know, everyone needs health care. Everyone needs a safe place to live and people need to eat, but they also need to thrive. And if we're not investing in children's education, we're undermining that ability for them to help themselves. And when you ask children what their number one priority is in an emergency, it's education. They want to be with their friends. They want to learn. They want to go to school. It's their main job, and it's one of the only things that they can't provide for themselves, and so that's where they really need external partners to come in. Um, education is such a virtuous cycle. By investing in education and investing in people, you know, it has so many returns economically and socially. Um, and you know, one of the biggest things I get is, well, if we give more money to education, then that means there's less money for healthcare or less money for immunizations. That is not true. Last year, we had the highest global expenditure in military spending in history. I think we reached $1.82 trillion. There's all the money in the world to do this work. There's no reason that any child should go unvaccinated, that any child should go hungry, or that any child shouldn't go to school. It's just about shifting those priorities. So, this is kind of cheesy, but I'm going to ask you to think in 3D. So we have 3Ds. When we think about working together, it's really about doing no harm, thinking about the dignity of the people that we're working with, and how can we diversify our efforts to work together. So these children, and this is one of my photos, that's why it's not fancy like the other ones, um, from the Central African Republic. These kids are so cute. Um, I went to their temporary learning space to see what they were learning, and nobody was there. They were just all playing outside. They weren't in the actual space that they were supposed to be because the teacher didn't show up that was supposed to be there. Now that's on me. That's on our program. It's our job to monitor and make sure people are being paid and showing up for work and ensuring that classes are going on for children. But we can see that there are other shortcomings in the services that we are providing. Thank you, Raj. Um, you can see that some of the children on the right have very light colored hair. That's a classic sign of malnutrition. And I asked them to show me where their toilet facilities were and the toilets were filthy. And the kids said they didn't use them because they were dirty. So this is a classic example of where we had an intervention but it was doing harm, so we set the expectation that they could go to school, but we didn't ensure that there were teachers there. And it's an example of where we undermine dignity by not maintaining the cleanliness of the sanitation facilities that we had provided. So we really realized that we needed to work with partners in different ways to make sure we had really good quality services when we delivered on what we promised. So we have to think always about what the work we're doing can do to prevent violations of children's rights, but also to promote them. 
and think about ways that we can work with people. And so that means working with the differently disabled, you know, differently abled. It means working with different kinds of communities. It means working in different ways. And it means thinking about how we work together so that it's participatory, so that it's inclusive. I'm going to come back to this 3D concept. Um, and the reason that we really encourage investment in education is because it is an enabling right. Being able to read and write and develop critical thinking skills are essential to realizing all your other rights. If you want to access good health care, if you want to vote and participate in your democracy, you have to have those basic skills. But we also know that education can be a driver of conflict. Um, it's a very complex relationship. So I work in the field of education and emergencies, and that means that I go to country offices um, where UNICEF is present to work with governments and partners on ensuring the continuity of safe and secure education, no matter what the situation is that's happening on the ground. So that may mean that there have been floods and landmines have moved. Is it still safe to go to school? What are the roads that children are taking to get there? What do we need to teach children and, teach, and students to keep themselves safe in these new conditions? It can also be something more complicated like updating curriculum when we see that there have been um, episodes of ethnic cleansing in the past or some kind of discrimination. How do we review the curriculum and the history to tell a different story about how people can, get, can work together? In many countries, we do simple things, just changing illustrations so that the doctors are also women, so that the mayor is also a woman, so that we see girls represented in non-traditional roles for that society, so that children are exposed to these ideas of equality as early as possible. And we know that education can be a massive driver of conflict. Um, I'd ask you to think back to the Arab Spring, like what started a lot of the unrest that's continued today in the Middle East. It was a lot about education and equality. It was about the lack of access to good jobs, the lack of access to opportunity. And just recently, last year, I was in Cameroon, again, where I was in the Peace Board, and I was really honored to go back and really eager to go back and see some of the communities that I work with. But it was a really sad story. Things had not gotten better. Um, I was in the Northwest and Southwest, where there is currently a civil war. And the civil war, in part, has been sparked by education and equality. The um, governing bodies in those areas, which is an Anglophone area, said that they'd only been getting sent Francophone teachers and had a Francophone curriculum being pushed on them, that their history, their stories, and their language were not being promoted. And so they put a strike on schools, and they objected to government interventions, and this led to um, many grievances and deepened the conflict in the area. So that was really tragic to see. And if we think about closer to home in the Central um, American migrant crisis, schools aren't safe. Children are being attacked um, by gangs. They're experiencing violence in their communities and their schools. And even though the journey is very dangerous, parents are willing to take it. They will do anything to give their kids better opportunities. So we have to think about how education can be a force for good and how we can mitigate the risks that come with education. And this means a lot to me. I know that many of you come from faraway places. My mother was an internally displaced person in South Korea during the war and came to America for better opportunities for us um, so we could have chances here. Now, the funny side of that is that Obviously, South Korean children are far outperforming U.S. children now in science and math, but I'm still very happy with the education that I received and the opportunities I've had in this country. But no one should have to leave their country for those opportunities. So, we talked about an agenda of leaving no one behind. But we know that there are lots of people being left behind. We know disabled children are out of school. We know that girls are accessing school or persisting in school the way that boys are. Um, we know that in areas that are affected by conflict and crisis, children are out of school. We know that when they're in school, they're not safe. Um, in most countries, there is not the opportunity for early childhood education. And we know this lays a critical foundation for early brain development and resilience, particularly in places where there's a lot of stress. And we particularly see that poor children are out of school in all countries. We also have a learning crisis. We started assessing basic literacy and numeracy around the world. And there are 617 million children who aren't meeting basic proficiency requirements. So while we've done a lot of work in increasing access to education, the quality of education that children are receiving when they're there are so poor that children in countries like Niger can't even read two basic sentences by the time they're in fourth grade. So what are they learning when they're in school? Um, this slide is for you all data people. Um, um, so what I want you to pay attention to is the gap between the top line and the bottom line. The left slide represents um, individuals using the internet, 
and the right side indicates people with mobile phone subscriptions. So what this is really about is access to information. And you can see that the lowest line is low-income countries, and the dark blue line on top is high-income countries. So there's a massive digital divide between access to information in the poorest countries and in the richest countries. And a lot of times what we see are people have technology solutions that are dependent upon internet connectivity or mobile phones, this assumption that everyone lives like us. And we have to remember that we're the privileged few, and we need to have solutions that work for the places that work, where people are in most need. So um, one of the things that I think is important to recognize about this kind of data is it really speaks to lack of, um, of access to electricity. There are 1.3 billion people in the world who lack access to basic um, electricity services. And only 32% of country, uh, schools and low-income countries have access to electricity. And this has a direct impact on children's ability to learn. It means that the instructional day is shorter because there are no lights. It often means they also don't have electricity at home, which makes it more difficult to engage in independent reading and homework assignments. So we see definitely lower learning outcomes in countries that don't have electricity. Um, we also know that there are obviously health consequences. If you don't have electricity, you're burning gas stoves or fires, and this creates a lot of air pollution that's very damaging to young lungs. So it has knock-on effects. All kinds of inequality have knock-on effects. So now I'm going to shift a bit to some of the opportunities to work together. I know I've painted a very bleak picture, but that's because I really want to motivate you all to do the most that you can to work with us to find solutions to these very complex problems. So one of the areas that we're engaging in is called Generation AI. And this is a partnership with the World Economic Forum, um, UC Berkeley, Microsoft, and others to really set a global agenda on artificial intelligence in children. Artificial intelligence um, is starting to seep into children's lives in ways that people our age can't really even imagine. Who owns data? How are we protecting children's privacy? Robotics and AI are starting to really integrate into um, high-income countries' education systems furthering the digital divide, but also introducing risks in Western and in high-income country classrooms. So this is an opportunity for us to come together and say, what is the government's role in regulating AI for children? And what are the future consequences that we can start to address now to protect children's rights, and even better, to advance children's rights? So we, the first step was to bring together experts and have consultations with experts to get their opinions on what we could be doing, but also to ask what you're already doing. I came here today and learned so much. There's so much work going on. How do we share that information in a way that comes together to really um, multiply our, our efforts? Um, and so we're, we have a sign-up page on our website, and you can sign up if you want to be a key informant or if you have data to contribute to this effort, and they're working on the next phases of this work. So this is really critical for setting a global agenda on how we protect children's rights. Um, another project that we have is Drones for Good. Um, so this photo is actually from Vanuatu. Um, this is one of our first vaccination trials. We're delivering um, vaccines, life-saving vaccines, to very, very remote islands that don't have health services. Um, and the kids love it. Oh my gosh, they get so excited when they see the drones coming. Um, and so it's not just about, again, doing for them. It's about strengthening the actual medical infrastructure to help the government of Vanuatu to adopt these technologies so they can reduce costs and reach more people. And so that's the more important part of this work that we're doing there. Um, and we're doing this work in the Pacific Islands. We're doing this in many Southern African countries. And we've also developed a zone um, <coughs> corridor in Kazakhstan. So what we're looking for are ways to support the integration of drones into more humanitarian action. Um, there are a lot of risks to introducing drones in areas of conflict because they're, you know, you're spying on us, you're taking video, they're associated with weaponry, but we also know that they could deploy really excellent benefits to these crisis situations. So we're looking for your advice and guidance on how we can do that. We started an African drone academy in Malawi. We would love your assistance and partnership and cooperation in Malawi, so if you're interested, let me know. And we're also trying to develop child-friendly regulatory frameworks. So we have opportunities for you to research with us, to advance our policy dialogue, but also to help us on the tech side. Um, this is a project that I'm really excited about. It's called Project Connect, um, and it's all about machine learning. And it's using machine learning to globally map internet connectivity of schools all around the world so that we can target those areas that don't have electricity and don't have internet access to close that digital divide. So what we're really looking for here are ways that we can collaborate around your engineering and data science expertise to strengthen our platform and optimize our algorithms. 
Um, we're also looking to connect to other data sets. So if you have data that might be interesting to us and may you know, strengthen our database, we welcome it. We're also looking for research on the impact of connectivity. We have some data that suggests that lack of connectivity does lead to um, dissatisfaction with the quality of education. Um, can, we already have data connecting lack of electricity to lower learning outcomes. But this is really an area that's ripe for research, and we'd like to have more data and collaboration around this. And then, of course, we want to think about those schools that are connected. How do we connect them? Where are the opportunities and what are the low-cost options to connect schools? Um, does anyone know what this picture is? Does anyone recognize this? Did anyone buy one of these? <laughs> That's right. This is a really famous initiative called One Laptop for Child. Um, and um, remember, we were talking about the 3Ds. This is a classic example of something that did not follow the 3Ds. Um, so this was the brainchild of, I think, an MIT um, professor who thought that technology could solve education problems around the world. And he built this very durable laptop that he could like throw across the room and it wouldn't break. And that was supposed to mean that it was a great solution for um, poor countries around the world who didn't have computer access. But um, he failed to think about how this might do harm in the context in which he was working fail to optimize the opportunity to advance people's dignity and to diversify partnerships. Um, and there are another 3D um, element that's much more linked to technology, and that's design, development, and deployment. Um, and he did not engage with partners on any of those as well. And so what we really learned was that, you know, if you want technology to work, we have to respect the dignity of the communities that we're working in. And the biggest feedback we got is that teachers felt really ashamed because te kids were getting the computers and they were being taught how to use them and teachers weren't. So they, and in societies where there are more, you know, traditional hierarchical structures, it was very shaming that the teachers weren't receiving the same level of education and it put them in a situation where they weren't able to support their students. So while independent learning is critically important, we also know that all the data shows that the two most important elements for children's improved learning outcomes are quality teachers and parental involvement. So we also needed to get the community involved. So the model just didn't work in terms of the deployment and design. I'm sorry, the, the, the development and design and deployment. Um, and the design was also very driven by um, Western companies and Western thinkers without thinking about what kinds of applications might be useful in the context in which um, these laptops were given out. So, I have another example of something that is working um, very much in the principles of 3D. So this is a photo from the Ivory Coast. Um, and the co com company that we're working with is a company called Conceptos Plasticos. It's a Colombian-based organization, um, and the founders are completely committed to social good. Um, they've had a lot of offers from major plastics manufacturers to fund their work, and they've declined that money because they only want to work with partners who are aligned with their social good um, approaches. So the idea behind this is that they're trying to build safe, low-cost schools and other infrastructures. They started in Colombia um, building homes in urban slum areas. We're deploying it in the Ivory Coast to build low-cost schools and health clinics. And the way the bricks are, are um, created is they take women's associations to collect post-consumer plastics. They wash and they sort that plastic and they put it into molds and there's an algorithm that figures out what kind of chemicals need to be added to make it always the same consistency and durability. And it puts out these bricks. And then we have very simple frames, and it assembles like Legos, so communities can build the structures themselves. Um, they're very safe. We've done a lot of testing on them. Um, the children can manage them themselves, even. So it's really about the entire chain of how we work. It's safe. It's solving two problems, providing classrooms and structures, but also helping eliminate plastic waste in the community. We're working with communities. Um, we're upgrading the facilities they're in, so if you think about dignity. Um, and we're also, we've contextualized the design. We had a great shiny first school that we showed the Ministry of Education, and they said, we don't like this model, <laughs> as it's not the way that we do things in Cote d'Ivoire, um, because we had a model that was built from Colombia. And in Colombia, apparently, I've never been to Colombia, the front of the school has no windows, because students will be distracted by people walking by. Um, but in Cote d'Ivoire, that's not the case. You want lots of windows because it's very hot, and they don't see it as a distraction when people are walking by, but instead that the principal can walk up and down and make sure that teachers are there and students are behaving. 
So we really had to adopt the model to fit the context and the values of the community we were working with, and we were happy to do that. And because of the Lego light construction, changing the design was low cost and easy. Um, the other um, applications of this that I think are important to emphasize is that it's something that really involves the community. The children are not just putting together a school, they're learning about what happens to their waste. They're learning about how to recycle. They're learning about how their actions and individual consumerism have an impact on the environment. So it's also like a hands-on science experiment for them and learning exercise. So it's really about practicing what we preach and integrating these elements and values into the curriculum and the ways we teach just as much as what we teach. Um, and then another thing that we're doing, um, I always tell people when they're asking me about how they can do something good in their communities, I always say you can do something now, start now, start small, start local. Um, and we're trying to inculcate young children with this idea. So we have this program called Kid Power and the children can wear these bands and it tracks their steps. And, for, and every time they reach certain milestones with steps, they earn little coins. And then they can also do this at the school level in the classroom, where they play active video games together as a class, um, and then they earn points. And when they get all these points and all these coins, they can try to trade them in for ready-to-use therapeutic foods. So this is for children who are suffering from severe malnutrition in low-income countries. They turn in their coins to UNICEF. We have a corporate partnership, and we're able to utilize that money to buy um, nutritional products for starving children. But they can also choose to use it for local community projects, planting trees or providing medical supplies and low-income clinics that are servicing underserviced um, populations. So it really teaches them from a young age that their actions matter, that they can make a difference, that their collective action matters, and that they can do things in their local community and on a global scale to help other people, and to really cultivate a sense of global citizenship. So... Um, again, I just really want you to think about those three Ds, do no harm, dignity, and diversify how we work. And when you're thinking about your technology, to also think about how you can include people in the design, the development, and the deployment of any technology that you're engaging in. And not after, but before, and during, and continuously throughout that process. So I just think it's so important to emphasize that how you do your work and who you do your work with is just as important as the work that you do. We want to see it make an impact and we want to do the most social good. I really would encourage you to keep that in mind. I really look forward to doing this good work together. Let's do it for the kids. Um, and so I just want to thank you so much for your time and attention. And I'm very happy to take any questions. question that does relate to technology and developing countries. Um, back in the day, we always were emphasizing appropriate technology for development, meaning that Western technology would not be appropriate for developing countries. We have to look at their specific needs and develop different technology that's for developing countries. While that, that philosophy still has its validity, there's also some appreciation of what's kind of called the leapfrog technology, meaning that Western technology has a legacy and inertia stuck in uh, what technology is being used in Western countries, but that developing countries are more of a clean sheet of paper. They can take the best technology and actually leapfrog ahead because they don't have that legacy problem in technology. How would you view this kind of um, almost a contradiction, or, or is it a contradiction? Thank you. That's a really thoughtful question, and I think that we can see a lot of immediate um, examples of that. If we think about, I don't know how many of you use Venmo or other kind of mobile cash transfer devices. That was all started in Sub-Saharan Africa. You know, we had mobile technologies, but they really changed the way that we were using phones for the purpose that met their needs, which was finding ways of safely 
um, transferring cash and using alternatives to banking systems. And so this idea of leapfrogging technology and new applications is really relevant. And I think, that, again, that's why co-design and development is critical. So it's not to say that we have this idea and for us to decide if it is or isn't appropriate in the context in which it's deployed, but to work with people to identify their problems and to think about what solutions they want to apply to those problems and absolutely to bring our technologies and our ideas to the table, but to always be open to that contextualization and specification. But I think, too, the onus on us is to think about how we utilize those opportunities to be as inclusive as possible, because even when we're working in other contexts, we're working with a small set of populations who tend to be more privileged or have more access to resources, and how do we widen that out to service the largest group of people? I have a question. Um, so you talked a little bit earlier on about working to help end the need, and we know that we're really not on track to meet the SDG goals, and a lot of people are talking about how we need the private sector on board in order to do that. Um, and you've shared some really great examples of how that's going on. Um, but what's, what about kind of a little bit of the, the flip side of the working, work, working with these technology companies to ensure that the first one of do no harm, so ensuring that these technologies in the future and the long term aren't going to be doing harm. Um, and, and maybe this question necessarily isn't for you, but for these companies and how they're, they're reaching out to UNICEF and other similar organizations that have contributions to make to ensure uh, that this, this work will do good. Um, if you could just speak a little bit about that. Absolutely, another great question. Um, so this is part of what Generation AI is trying to do, is set out a regulatory framework that can help provide a global governance structure for determining how corporations should work. You know, all of these areas are fraught with um, the need to allow innovation and allow rapid um, evolution of ideas, but also to provide some regulation to protect end users and to um, ensure that we're not doing any harm. Um, UNICEF's approach is really to engage in a lot of corporate social responsibility work. So we get a lot of offers for financing or partnership with companies that are perhaps not always engaged in the best practices. Um, we, say, we see that there's a lot of good intentions. We get a lot of uh, medical donations and donations of water bottles in times of crisis. And while to some extent those things are welcome, oftentimes there isn't thought about what the implications are for paying the costs of getting those through customs or storage or being able to deploy those medications before they're expired or to store them in, in safe manner. We also see um, corporations you know, contributing to unnecessary plastic waste um, and excessive goods in certain areas. So there are a lot of immediate applications to ensuring that we're not doing any harm in our humanitarian interventions and providing the best guidance to our corporate partners who want to assist when something bad happens, which we want to always encourage. But when it comes to these bigger ideas around regulation, um, we are engaged in a number of um, discussions around regulatory um, issues, and so that can be everything from children in armed conflict and munitions. We just were speaking in Vienna last week um, about explosive weapons and how we can strengthen regulations and agreements on protecting civilian populations from the use of explosion, explosive we weapons and cluster munitions. But we're also you know, having this conversation around AI and data privacy and thinking about links to child trafficking. And um, we have a lot of um, work to do when it comes to technologies and how they're deployed and how we align ourselves with companies that may be investing part of their portfolio in issues that are social good, but the other part of their portfolio is investing in technologies that are actually doing significant harm. And so that's where our corporate social responsibility teams come in to say, we don't want to say no yet, but we want to continue to educate you and work together to see if we can shift the ways that you're working to better service everyone and to do, to do good. I have a quick question, sort of a longish question, so just bear with me. Uh, this is sparked by the remark you made about uh, South Korea uh, excelling in science and math as it refers to the US education system. So there's this concept called reverse innovation, which you might have heard of, which is basically particularly applies to technology. Uh, typically, technology is developed in the developed world, Western world, and then it trickles down to the developing world. Uh, reverse innovation actually works the other way around. Technology that's developed in the developed world finds its way up or trickle ups, trickles up to the uh, developed world. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering if this analogy would apply to education in particular. Can we learn lessons that work in a 
for lack of a better word, poorer country, mm -hmm. can it work in uh, a richer country and are there any examples you can give from your experience? That's a really good question as well and I think that there's a lot that we can learn from the way that communities are organizing to provide education and the way that communities are organizing to overcome educational inequality. And so one practice that I've seen in local communities um, that have less resources is integration of children with disabilities. So in the United States, for instance, it's still very much a fraught issue whether or not children with disabilities should go to special schools where they can access the specialized services they need, or if they're um, being better prepared for life in the real world if they're integrated with, with um, students that are not disabled, and if children without disabilities are served um, in terms of social emotional learning and compassion by being exposed to children that are different than them. And um, our lower income contexts in which we work, integration is always the model, partly because they don't have the choice of building special schools. There's already a huge shortage of schools. So it's really about ensuring that children are ready to live and work and study and play with children that are different than them and thinking about the ways that we can approach inclusive education without you having to have a PhD in inclusive education. If you're just a regular teacher in a place that probably hasn't provided you adequate teacher training to begin with, what are the core skills and adaptation techniques that can be used to fully integrate children with disabilities in the classrooms? So I think that most of the solutions that we see coming out of low-income contexts that are relevant to us are really around community engagement. It's about community mobilization for closing gaps, particularly around inequality, because again, one of the strongest points of evidence we have is that parental engagement is one of the best indicators for children's um, outcomes and school performance. And yet we see many schools in the United States and communities withdrawing into themselves and taking their children out of certain schools and not getting engaged. Um, and not distributing resources equally. So I think there's a lot to learn about how we provide education, how we engage in education, how we include more and different kinds of children in education that's coming from um, developing contexts. Um, so conflict minerals, and, I'm, I'm, and a lot of our technologies that we use come from conflict minerals or potentially conflict minerals. Mm -hmm. But the angle I'm thinking on this is that there are countries that could perhaps lift themselves up if they had more control over these minerals. So is there anything that's going on to you know, use that as a way of, I don't know, just empowering the people in those localities and giving themselves more control and wealth mm -hmm. uh, instead of like developed countries getting the benefits from all that? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Natural resources continue to be a real curse. Um, I worked in the Democratic Republic of Congo for a long time, which is um, bordering Rwanda, which is one of the biggest exporters of the natural mineral that they don't own. There is none of this natural mineral, mineral in their country. It's all coming explicitly from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and it's just trafficking across the border, and I don't, can't remember what it's called, but it's using phone chips. Um, and so we saw a lot of exploited labor practices and especially a lot of exploited child labor. And a lot of this labor is labor that we consider the most dangerous forms of child labor. And so this is something we've certainly been engaging with corporations on in country. But I think that the ones who really hold the power are national governments. And so this leads into issues of governance and corruption and how we determine um, oversight of these corporations in country. But we have done a lot of work with corporations um, and with armed groups and trying to socialize them around concepts of responsibility and protection, trying to inform them, inform, inform them about rules and regulations and laws that exist. Because many of these countries do have laws that protect against child labor or exploitative labor practices, but they're not enforced. And so we're also trying to implement greater systems for monitoring and reporting that protect the identity of reporters. Um, and this is a big area for an opportunity for like blockchain technologies to how can we secure, securely send information and protect the identity of people who are reporting on schools that are attacked around exploitative labor practices, around the use of child labor. And so it's really an area for um, further development and where we're looking for partnership. But um, the best thing that we can do in country is to really remind governments that they have committed to the Convention of the Rights of the Child. Almost every nation in the world has and ratified, has endorsed or ratified the CRC, which is having its 30th anniversary this year. Um, and so we have to remind them of the commitments that they've made. I recently had a very difficult conversation about a government that's engaged in very egregious child rights abuses, and they wanted to give a minister in this government an award 
And so half the team was like, you can't give them an award, they're terrible human rights abusers. And the other half of the team was like, well, if we give them this award and put them in the spotlight for doing something good, maybe it'll put more pressure on them to continue to do good and let people know that we're watching them. If we make them a spokesperson for this issue, then perhaps that's a way to change their behavior in their country as they're put out and you know they could be called um, out on it by the media and others if they're engaged in contradictory actions from the platform that we're giving them. So these negotiations are quite complex and depend on the political context and our contacts within government, um, but we do try to push for direct negotiations with large corporations in country and work with monetary bodies to help make sure that those violations are reported. Hi, um, thank you for the talk. It's really, really motivating. Um, so I just kind of wanted to ask, I think, um, for me, like sometimes the difficulty is like thinking of, you know, where I am right now. It's like okay, the research that I'm doing may or may not be directly, immediately relevant, helpful right now. Um, like, what can I do, like as a person in academics? Um, I don't know. Like, I think like could you maybe comment on ways that maybe um, people in research and in academics can go about um, like doing good or having a positive impact, um, even if that doesn't mean um, you know, robotics having like a direct like interventional um, kind of impact, but maybe like sharing the fruits of all the advances and empowerment and, um, you know, just like riches that are going to come out of this technology with people and kind of bringing people to the table and making sure that not just um, people with privilege and power get a slice of the pie, so to speak. I don't know if that looks, yes. uh, makes sense. <laughs> No, and thank you for that question. I think that's really important for all of us. I have a really dear friend that I just love to pieces. We went to graduate school together. He's um, just submitted his, he just defended his PhD in the spring and he graduated. And he was explaining it to me, but I didn't really understand at all what it was that he was doing. So I was just like, why don't you just skip ahead to, you tell, to the part where you tell me how it's applied? What are the practical applications? And the look on his face, you would think that I had just punched him in the stomach. <laughs> he looked so upset that I asked him this. You know? And I didn't realize that I was making this big faux pas. I thought, surely all of you have predetermined applications for your work. Um, so I think that that's the first thing to to ask yourself is to think ahead to what are the applications. Again, that principle of do no harm. Is there anything that you're doing now that could be misused in the future? And if there is, how could you mitigate that? And then what's the way to maximize the good of the research that you're doing? And I would, I would challenge you to, to work with different kinds of people. You know, is there a research partnership that you can engage in with a Southern University or a Southern researcher? Are there ways that you can start sharing information that can help boost work that's happening in Southern universities? Because again, that really strengthens those bonds and relationships and local solutions. But again, I would also encourage you to act locally. Like, who can you mentor locally? Who can you give talks at local schools that are underserved, particularly in the kind of in, um, in a place like Maryland? Um, you know, there are a lot of inequalities in the public school systems here, and so you can start locally and start close to home. But to really think about how to utilize your voice and your position, your knowledge and information to make more people a part of the process. So again, it's like how we work and who we work with is just as important as your research. So even if you can't yet determine what the applications of that research will be, and I'm sure they'll be, um, you know, multiplied as the technology advances, you can think about how to include more people along the way in the process. So I actually have a question following up on this one, because we touched on what we as a science academic community can really do with our research and sort of thinking about that in the future effects. Um, you mentioned, Greta, a lot of the, so a lot of the issues of inequality some about from policy changes as well. Are, is there anything that we can do as an academic community to kind of help push that forward? Yes, there's so much. I mean, first of all, vote. <laughs> be politically engaged, you know, be involved in political movements, um, support science. Um, but we have seen universities that have come forward, and we've done this in conjunction with universities, where we write research paper and pull together the evidence to help Congress um, people make their decisions, to help them form policies and briefs. And um, so we, we do testify, we do provide um, information to the government to help them make their decisions 
and of course we're always talking from, um, we, we work at a national level through UNICEF USA, which is a national affiliate to UNICEF, um, but then of course we work through the General Assembly system to advance issues, but we also, we always welcome evidence. We have currently um, an education commission that's chaired by Gordon Brown, the previous Prime Minister um, of the UK, and what he's done is really try to demonstrate that governments aren't meeting their commitments, like local financing, domestic financing is not meeting our recommended levels of financing at all, and that this is having dire consequences, and that while the number of dollars going into overseas development assistance for education has increased, the percentage of overall ODA has decreased for education. And so this kind of analysis and what the consequences are. So again, if you help us with research that really looks at the impact of connectivity and how that can improve educational outcomes, that helps us provide those economic arguments at country level and how they use their budgets. And that's one of the most important things we do in country. When we're in a country like Malawi, we're meeting with the government and we're looking at their budgets with them. We're trying to help them allocate those dollars to be as equitable as possible, but we need the data. Um, any more questions? Okay, well with that, let's 